as Pastor Andrew mentioned, my name is Tito Torado, for those of you who may not know me. And I am delighted and excited to have the opportunity to share God's word with you. We are continuing our series, Got Questions. And today we're going to tackle the question, how do I know the will of God? We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 12. By the way, thank you, Pastor Andrew, for complimenting my clothes. And it, it said... You know, sometimes you're sitting there, I think the preacher got overdressed because this sermon is really bad. <laughs> and so we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 21. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word. I ask, Father, that you would minister grace to the hearers, that you would, Father, let your word go forth with power and change hearts, transform lives so that your son Jesus might be exalted. I pray that you would give us the presence of mind to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. Help me to speak with clarity and accuracy the things that are contained in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. There are some common questions that people often ask themselves in seeking the will of God, like, who do I marry? What is my purpose in life? What should I major in college? Which career path should I take? If you're in the military and you have to do TDY and you have options of different states to move, which state should I move to? Just look at how many license plates are in that state and you go to that state. No, don't do that. For, for those of you who may be in a situation where you have various job options, which job do I take? Answering these questions requires a certain level of wisdom and biblical handles that I'd like to share with you at the end of the sermon. The Bible teaches us in Deuteronomy 29, 29, that the things that the secret things belong to God, but the things that have been revealed belong to us and to our children that we might do the word of God, that we might walk in the commandments of the Lord. And so we see that the Bible teaches us that there is a revealed will of God, which is contained in his word, and there are secret things or the specific will of God, which he holds close to his vest. And in order for us to better discern God's specific, specific or his secret will, we must first be committed to follow his revealed will, which is contained in his word, which brings us to verse number one. Let's pick up the reading there in verse number one of Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul appeals to his audience by the mercies of God. What mercies is he talking about? Here he's referring to the mercies he mentioned in Romans chapter 11, verse 31, where we are informed that God has shown us mercy. It is the mercy that God has shown us in the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is that we were born into sin. We have inherited sin from our father Adam, and because of this, we cannot of our own volition meet the righteous requirements of God. We cannot meet God's standards because God's standard is not that we are good. God's standard is that we are perfect. Therefore, God sent forth his son, Jesus Christ, who was God in the flesh, 100% God, 100% man, and he lived a 
perfect life, the perfect life that you and I cannot live, and he died on the cross as a substitute for our sin, was buried, placed in the tomb, and on the third day rose again from the dead to prove to us that he was God and to give us the hope of eternal life. That is the gospel. And now, as a result of that, we can simply repent of our sins and believe the gospel, the substitutionary death, that God took our sin and the wrath that was justly due to us, and he placed it on Christ. And when we believe that, then the perfect works of Christ are credited to us, and we receive Christ into our lives, and the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. This helps us understand that Paul is writing to followers of Christ. Paul is writing to Christians. He writes to those who have received God's mercies. And because of what God has done for us in Christ, we are called to present our bodies a living sacrifice in order to discern the will of God, what is acceptable and what is good and what is perfect. Interestingly enough, the Old Testament animal sacrifices also had to be good and acceptable and perfect according to Leviticus 4.32. And what I love about God is that he is faithful to reveal his will. He has given his revealed will and his word, and he will be faithful to make known his secret and his specific will in time. However, God calls us to walk in his revealed will first before he reveals his specific will. And in the process of obeying his revealed will or his word, he shows us things that we need to know in our lives. Oh, we see this example in Abraham's life. When in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, God says, Abraham, leave your family, leave your kinfolks, go to a land that I will show you. Abraham left, he obeyed the word of God, not knowing where he was going. And yet in time, later on, God shows him the land he would inherit. God shows him that his descendants would be multiple. And he tells him that Sarah would have a child in her old age. Through every act of obedience, God progressively revealed his specific will to Abraham. So we see that even with Abraham, who is God's friend, God revealed his specific will to him as he obeyed his revealed will, as Abraham obeyed his word. What's even more interesting, the Bible gives us some specific verses that speak directly to the will of God. Excuse me for a moment. Oh, this is nice and cold. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Bible says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. God wants us to be thankful. It is his will for us to be thankful. Or I have to ask you today, are you thankful? Or did you come to church feeling a little grumpy this morning? Are you a pessimist? Do you always see the cup half empty in everything? Give thanks. Then there's another verse in 1 Peter 4.19. It says, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him as unto a faithful creator. There are those times that God calls us to go through difficult situations. And I'm going to make a sidebar and then come back here. There are times... We can abandon God's will for our lives because things get hard. There are times that we can abandon God's will for our lives because things get difficult. 
There are times that we can abandon God's will for our life because things get uncomfortable or we are experiencing some type of suffering. I remember meeting a man that hated the job that he was in. His boss would give him the business. His boss would make him work uh, harder than all the other employees, but he was free on Sundays. He was able to go to small group. He was involved in mentorship. He was very engaged in the church. He was growing spiritually, but he was intent on leaving this job because things were uncomfortable. And he wound up getting a better job with better pay, only the job did not allow for him to come to church. The job did not allow for him to come to small group. The job schedule caused his spiritual life to plummet. And to this day, I don't even know if he is still walking with the Lord. Like I said, there are times that we can abandon God's will for our lives because things get difficult. I regress. And there's yet another verse that speaks specifically to God's will for our lives. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 2, the Bible says, this is the will of God, our sanctification, and that we abstain from immorality, which brings us to point number one. God wills our sanctification. Sanctification means growing in holiness. Christians ought to make it their aim to grow a holy character. This means that we are to commit to grow in holiness, letter A. We are called to grow in holiness. So we see that in verse 1, God calls us to present our bodies a living sacrifice. This means that we are called to lay down our lives. This means complete surrender. Uh, I heard a preacher tell tell an interesting story uh, between the difference that a chicken and a pig bring to a bacon and egg breakfast. The chicken makes a contribution, but the pig gives his all. And if we are honest with ourselves, isn't that what we do with God sometimes? We give him an egg here and there, but God wants sacrifice. Now, I want to make it abundantly clear. I am not suggesting that we become pigs. But what I am suggesting is that we we be willing to give God our all. First, Paul tells us what to do, be sanctified. Then he instructs us how to do it. We are to have our minds transformed by the word of God. Our minds need to be saturated by the word of God. How do we do this? Well, I am glad you asked. We read God's word, we hear God's word, we meditate on God's word, we memorize God's word, and we study God's word. When we purpose in our hearts to lay our lives down, we are also saying that we want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds by the power of God's word. In our desire to want to know God's specific will for our lives, we must ask ourselves, am I purposely committing myself to sanctification? Am I purposely committing myself to grow in holiness? Am I really willing to lay my life down for the cause of Christ. For it is in the process of growing in holiness that God's specific will becomes clearer to us. Let's continue our reading there in verse number three. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, 
each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in the proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, to the one who teaches in his teaching, to the one who exhorts in his exhortation, to the one who contributes in his generosity, to the one who leads with seal, to the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. In these verses, we see that Paul speaks to us about using our spiritual gifts. First, Paul instructs the church that they purpose to grow in holiness. Then he instructs them to use their spiritual gifts, which brings us to point number two. God wills that we serve with our spiritual gifts. We see Paul mention several spiritual gifts. Some gifts entail speaking like teaching and prophecy, which in this context is sharing with others the tenets of our faith. He also mentions exhortation and leadership, which also require speaking. But then he also mentions gifts that require doing things like showing mercy to someone like giving generously, like serving. And serving merely means finding a place where there is a need and helping. And one of the things we will discover is that as we purpose in our hearts that we are going to serve God by serving others, that we start to get a clearer picture of God's will for our lives. There is a story in the gospel according to St. John chapter 2, where Jesus attends a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and they ran out of wine. Jesus instructs the servants to take water and fill up six water pots and then draw the water and take it to the master of the ceremony. As they drew the water and served it, Jesus revealed his will, which was to turn the water into wine. Somewhere between the time they filled the water pots, they drew the water and took it to the master of the ceremony. The water turned into wine. In the same way those servants experienced Jesus' miraculous power as they obeyed his words by filling the water pots and drawing the water, we too will discover God's plans for our lives as we obey his word and serve him with our gifts. As we are faithful to serve God, he is faithful to reveal his specific will to us. If we're faithful over few, he will entrust us with more. Matthew 25, 25, 23. On the other hand, if we avoid the growing pains of sanctification and the inconvenience that sometimes is serving others, we might just miss out on what God wants to show us along the journey. For this reason, we must purpose in our hearts to obey God by getting involved in serving. And in the process of being faithful to serve, we will find that he is faithful to help us understand his plans. He's faithful to help us understand his purposes. And he is faithful to help us understand his will for our lives. Oh, I have to pause here and ask you, are you using your gifts? Are you doing connect, grow, serve, multiply? Are you engaged? Jesus said, Whoever wants to be great among you, let him become your servant. Oftentimes, the connections we need, we find them as we serve. Oftentimes, the relationships that God intends us to have, we find them as we serve. Oftentimes, the resourcefulness God wants to make available to us, come to us 
as we serve. The answers we need and even the dispensations of God's grace come as we are engaged in in serving. So far, we have seen that God wills our sanctification and he wills our service. Let's continue reading in verse number nine and we see what else he says. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in seal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Here, Paul gives specific instructions about Christian living. He mentions loving each other with sincerity and with affection. We are to be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. We are to live humbly and honorably before the Lord and others. Then he says, avoid depending on our own wisdom. Rather, we must seek the wisdom of God. We are to live peacefully with all men and be forgiving and merciful and not vindictive, but actually to do good for those who are our enemies when they are in need. We are not to let the evils that others do overcome us, but rather we ought to let the light of Christ shine through and conquer the evil by doing good, which leads us to point number three. God's specific will is often discovered as we show the fruit of spiritual maturity. Paul set forth a very lofty and clear standard for Christian living. He describes in detail what it looks like when a follower of Christ is fruitful and spiritually mature. In fact, when we read this list, it almost feels overwhelming and it can feel impossible. However, this standard of Christian living is possible when we purpose in our hearts that we are going to pursue sanctification. And we are committed to allow the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to transform our hearts. It's not behavior modification. It's not being a good person. It's not moralism. It's being transformed on the inside by the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do this in our own strength. Jesus said, separated from me, you can do nothing. It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I like what Jesus said to the Pharisees when they were talking about behavior modification. He said, clean the inside of the cup first, and then the outside will be clean others also. In other words, Christian character is developed and displayed through an inner change of the Holy Spirit. 
Dr. Joseph Stoll said, Christ's call means that we are to come after him. And the essence of that call also entails direction. And when we are committed to these things, sanctification, serving, spiritually mature character, God will be faithful to guide us into his specific will for our lives. Now, let me conclude this morning by giving us some practical biblical handles how to discern God's will. Now, let me say this is not an exhaustive list and it is not a perfect list, but it gives us some riverbanks. It gives us some handles on how to know whether or not God is directing us. Number one, commitment. Are you committed to follow Christ? Are you committed to prayer? Are you committed to see him work in your life? Are you devoted to him? Psalm 37 verse 5 says, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. And in Proverbs 16, it says, commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. Number two, the commandments. Psalm 119, 105 says that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. As we are committed to follow Christ and we are committed to his word, we are in a better position to begin to be in a place where God can direct us. Number three, circumstances. Revelation chapter three, verse eight says this, behold, I set before you an open door that no man can shut. Is God opening the door for you to do that? Or are you knocking and trying to push open the door? Is the opportunity available for you to do that in addition to your commitment, in addition to you following the commandment? I've had some people come uh, tell me that they came to a girl and said, God told me I'm supposed to marry you. I said, the boy, the girl doesn't even like you. Is the opportunity available? Are the circumstances lined up? Number four, counsel. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22 says, without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. In Proverbs 20, 18, plans are established by counsel and by wise counsel wage war. For in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Let me say something. When you are seeking counsel, number one, is the person who you're seeking counsel from competent and capable in the area that you're seeking counsel from? Number two, did they do they have a heart for God? Are they a person that is spiritually mature and biblically wise? And number three, are they familiar with you? And finally, the calmness. If I can, if I can have the worship team come up. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. That word rule there is the Greek word brabuo. It actually means to act as the arbiter. Do you have peace about what you're doing? Or is the direction that you're taking taking away your peace? The book of Isaiah says that we shall be led forth in peace. Again, these are just some riverbanks, some spiritual handles on how to know if God is directing us in a specific way. It is not exhaustive and it is not perfect. These are just some ways for us to know if God's hand is leading us in a specific direction. At the end of the day, let me say this to you. There are times that God calls us to live with the question mark. God, why did this happen? Why haven't you told me this? Can you live with a question mark? God calls us at times 
to trust him, even though we don't know what we're going to do next. Abraham, go to a place that I will show you. Now, before I pray, let me ask you this. Are you in the will of God? Are you saved? Do you know that you have eternal life? And if you are saved, are you purposely pursuing sanctification? Are you serving with your gifts? And is spiritual maturity your objective? Is it being developed, displayed in your life? If not, there will be some people here underneath the screens to pray with you about these things that I've been talking to you about. Would you stand to your feet and let us pray? Father, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word this morning. Lord, your word teaches us that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and you delight in his ways. Perhaps someone today, Lord, needs to get in your will by receiving Christ into their hearts. Perhaps someone today, Lord, is struggling what the next steps are for them. I pray that you would give them the ability to trust and have the faith to know that you are faithful to lead them and guide them through your word and through the processes that you outlined in your word. I want to pray your blessings and your goodness and your graces on your people. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.